very positive note um, and a happy note and a relieved note that we are also um, inviting to speak today here Petros Der Motosyan, who is an assistant professor of modern Middle Eastern history in the Department of History at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Born and raised in Jerusalem, he is a graduate of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he began his studies in the Department of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies. He completed his PhD, uh, however, in the United States in uh, the Department of Middle Eastern History as well um, at Columbia University in 2008. His dissertation is on ethnic politics in post-revolutionary Ottoman Empire, looking at um, Armenians, Arabs, and Jews in the second constitutional period after the Young Turk Revolution. I think this is really one of the strengths of Bedros's work is that he's really bringing in Armenians again into a dialogue with um, Jews as well as Arabs in the context of um, Jerusalem and in the context of the Ottoman Empire. He had a great committee. I wish actually um, it must have been very fun to have been part of that committee. Rashid Khalidi was his advisor, Nader Sohrabi his chair, Karen Barkey, as well as our own very Brink Messick um, acting as members of his dissertation uh, com uh, committee. His dissertation dealt with inter-ethnic politics during these first years of the Second uh, Constitutional Revolution, which led to both a dramatic escalation of ethnic tensions culminating in the counter-revolution and in the Adana massacres of 1909. Bedros's areas of interest move beyond just ethnic politics in the Middle East, um, into inter-ethnic violence in the Ottoman Empire generally, social and economic history of the Middle East in the 19th and 20th century, and the history of uh, the Armenian genocide and modern Armenian um, history. As you will see today, his lecture is about modernity and the genocide, again, refusing to be cast within this isolated and parochial, sorry, uh, context of Armenian history, but really to bring into a comparative dialogue, uh, the Armenian genocide together with the case of uh, Rwanda as well as Darfur. So please join me in uh, welcoming Petros Dermotosian. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, Professor Catherine Bawayan, the Armenian Studies Program here at the University. Uh, Natasha also did a great job. Uh, the co-sponsors, Centers of, for Middle East, Middle Eastern and North African Studies and African Studies uh, program here at the university. Uh, the talk today will deal with modernity and genocide. I've taken a daunting task, actually, trying to understand the concepts of modernity and genocide and their relationship to the Armenian Rwandan and Darfur cases. And it's a daunting task because I haven't come to a conclusion. I have some humble suggestions and observations. And uh, your feedback is extremely important, I think. Uh, there's no definite answer to a lot of things. So it's a dialogue that I'm trying to uh, initiate. And uh, so basically, the, the lecture is divided into a couple of sections. I will start with an introduction, then talk about the discourse of modernity and, the, and, and, and genocide or Holocaust, and then move uh, on 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 uh, represent on on giving a brief overview overview of the, of the three genocides, and then I've chosen three themes uh, to analyze the uh, the three genocides. These themes are. These themes are. Can you hear, sir, in the back? Yeah. These themes are uh, ideology. Second one is uh, methods of mobilization, implementation, and and uh, uh, propaganda, and finally the tools of murder of uh, implementation. On October 2, 1904, General, General Lothar von Trotha, the newly arrived commander of the German forces in Southwest Africa, promulgated his infamous Schrecklichkeit, atrocity or extermination order, in an attempt to destroy out the last embers of Herero revolt before the end of the year. Part of the order read, and I quote, any Herero found within the German borders with or without a gun with or without a cattle, will be shot. I shall no longer receive any women or children 
I will drive them back to their people or I will shoot them. This is my decision for the Herero people, end quote. The once proud Herero tribe that had numbered about 80,000 people had lost more than half of its population in the end of the genocide. By 1911, Herero lost 81% of their population and most of their land was confiscated by the Germans. The remaining Herero were reduced to a permanent class of forced labor serving their colonial masters. The genocide of the Hereros, the first genocide of the 20th century, launched one of the darkest phases of modern world history. The systematic annihilation and extermination of indigenous populations around the globe. Genocides are not only a modern phenomenon pertaining to the modern world, rather they have existed in some fashion in the pre-modern world. What distinguishes the genocide of the modern, and whenever I use modern, it's quote-unquote quote modern, by the way, period from other incidents of mass violence is that they have become more organized, intense, intense and lethal. With the development of ideas of race, ethnicity, and nationalism in the 18th and the 19th century, genocides became more ideological in their attempt in justifying the annihilation of indigenous population. Thus, the 20th century became the century of the most intense violence, violence characterized by two world wars, revolutions, colonial anti-colonial violence, mass killing, ethnic cleansing, ethnic conflict, communal violence, among many other forms of mass violence. The major victims of all these acts of violence were the non-combatant civilians who perished as part of a state-sanctioned violence. The lives of the innocent civilians and the magnitude of the organized violence prompted scholars to come up with a new concept to define the horrendous acts of violence. During the Second World War, the Polish jurist Rafael Lemkin introduced the concept of genocide in a small book entitled Access Rule in Occupied Europe. In the book, Lemkin broadened the concept of genocide, arguing, and I quote, generally speaking, genocide does not necessarily mean the immediate destruction of a nation. It is intended rather to signify a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of the life of national groups with the aim of annihilating the group themselves. The objectives of such a plan would be disintegration of the political and social institutions of culture, language, national feelings, religion and economic existence of national groups and the destruction of the personal security, liberty, health, dignity, and even the lives of the individuals belonging to such groups, end quote. Later, Lemkin helped the U United Nations in formulating its Convention on the Prevention and, and, and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in 1948. The definition of the concept of genocide by the Convention was a political compromise. It was a political compromise between the major powers which defined genocide as acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. So basically, political groups and other social groups were not included in the, in the definition, which would be very problematic when it would deal with Stalin's regime and other regimes. Despite its weakness, some scholars argue that the Genocide Convention still provides us with a, uh, with a productive working definition that can guide the study of mass violence orchestrated by states. The aim of this lecture is to examine the concept of genocide and modernity in relation to three understudied, understudied cases of the 20th century, that of the Armenian, the Rwandan, and the Darfurian cases. The discourse of genocide modernity remains a source of contention within the historiography of genocide and Holocaust studies. Scholars are still debate, debating whether the mass murders of 20th century are exclusively the byproduct of modernity, exclusively the byproduct of modernity, or the outcome of the breakdown of civilization, progress, and reason within their respective societies. However, majority of scholarship and historiography on modernity and genocides tend, tend to concentrate on the Holocaust. So after discussing the debate, deb debate on genocide and modernity, the following talk will concentrate more on analyzing the three understood cases within the historiography. By looking at the three cases, my lecture will argue that modernity was, to a certain extent, one factor out of the numerous factors in these genocide and not necessarily a byproduct of modernity. I will e examine the ways in which the three cases contributed the discourse on modernity of genocides in the 20th century. Now I'm moving on to discuss a bit in depth the concept of genocide and modernity. When dealing with the genocide of 20th century, it is difficult not to imagine the intimate relationship between genocide and modernity. The scale of genocide, 
and its frequency around the globe in the modern period denotes that the crisis of modernization resulted in the destruction of human communities. The scholars of genocide and Holocaust studies approach different cases of genocide by meshing together the components of the mixture of modernity, ideas of race, nation, ethnicity, utopian ideology, state terror, bureaucratic advancements, industrial tools, and of course, the ambivalence of bystanders. It is impossible to discuss the modernity of genocide without referring to the influential work of Zygmunt Bauman entitled Modernity and the Holocaust. Drawing upon Hannah Arendt and Theodor Adorno's books on totalitarianism and enlightenment, Bauman developed the argument that the Holocaust, and I quote, was born and executed in our modern rational society at the high stage of our civilization and at the peak of human cultural achievement. And for this reason, it is a problem of that society, civilization, and culture, end note. Thus, the Holocaust, according to him, should not be considered as an act of an irrational outflow of not yet fully eradicated residues of pre-modern barbarity, nor, as he says, a bizarre and aberrant episode in modern history. Rather, it was a legitimate resident in the house of modernity. In addition to technological advancement as the one of the modern connections of the Holocaust, Bauman emphasizes its intimate link to the pattern of authority developed to perfection in modern bureaucracy. Thus, for Bauman, the technical administrative success of the Holocaust was due in part to the skill utilization of moral sleeping pills, as he said, he says, made available by modern bureaucracy and modern te technology. Bauman's conclusion then is that the Holocaust was characteristically modern phenomenon that cannot be understood out of the context of cultural tendencies and technical achievements of modernity. Equally influential is the opposite side that tends to represent the genocide in the modern period as anti-modern or counter-enlightenment currents and ideologies represented at the time of the breakdown of civilization. For example, noted sociologist El Norbert Elias represents the Nazi period of, as collapse of civiliza 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 civilization and called the acts against the Jews as barbarities in showing that the Holocaust was a deviation from the main track of civil civilizing process and a deep betrayal of the spirit of modernity. By deviating from these diametric approaches, genocide scholar Dan Stone argues that genocide violence is intrinsic to all human societies at all stages of history. For him, the characteristic of modernity is the barbaric behavior modern societies can produce because they stifle non-rational behavior. However, for our three cases, the most powerful explanation is the post-colonial perspective that criticizes modernity as a Eurocentric project that requires a critical approach because in the end of the day, most of the non-European societies experience the project of modernity in the words of Dirk Moses as, and I quote, a European license to dominate them because it implies their own backwardness, end quote. Thus the major pitfall of Eurocentric approach pertaining to modernity is that it tends to focus on the Holocaust, totalitarianism, fascism, and Nazism. In doing so, any understanding of the relationship between genocide and modernity had to be done through Europe and the Holocaust. This approach consequently led to the marginalization of colonialism and non-European genocides. What I would argue that the breadth and the depth of 20th century non-European genocide should not be viewed from the perspective of modernity of the Holocaust, nor take the Holocaust as a barom barometer of the genocide. Rather, it should be analyzed through the prism of semi-colonial and post-colonial framework during which a process of modernization according to the existing exegesis and variants were at play. The three, country which were, the three countries which were struggling with the process of modernization were peripheral countries in the pure sense of economics and had different ways and norms adapting to modernization. Thus, the three genocides took place in the periphery and not in the industrial cores of global capitalism like that of the Holocaust. It took place, it took place in countries and areas that were, are, grappling with the process of colonial, post-colonial modernity. Thus, they are byproduct of the process of modernization taking place in semi-post-colonial era. In the case of Rwanda, the Belgian colonialism introduced a disfigured I would argue disfigured norm of modernization represented in the forceful imposition of a time bomb ideology. The British created Sudan that inherited from its master one of the aspects of colonialism, 
internal colonialism, a word first used by Lowe Marcard in 1957, referring to the South African case. In, the Sudan, in, Sudan, in Sudanese case, Arab, quote-unquote, Arab Khartoum, became the center and African Darfur, African, quote-unquote, is considered, was, is considered as the neglected periphery. In the case of the Ottoman Empire, the political economic semi-colonialism coupled with the imported idea of nationalism and homogeneity in its modernization process played an important role in the Armenian genocide. Thus, in these three cases, modernity was a factor and not an, not an outcome. It was one of the components. In order to evaluate the quote-unquote modernity of these genocide, I will employ three themes in my analysis. The first one is ideology, either ideology of racism or nationalism. Second, propaganda mobilization and orders of extermination, and third, tools of implementation. I would conclude with, the pr with problematizing the concept of modernity and demonstrate that using the concept of modernity as an explanation of these genocide dispel into a foggy landscape filled with pre-modern acts of brutal violence, a byproduct of an imposed and disfigured modernization process under the guise of semi-colonialism and total colonialism. Before analyzing these Three, these cases, in a thematic form, I seem it necessary to give a brief overview for those who don't know what's happened during, in, in the Armenian genocide or for those who don't know the Rwandan case or the Darfurian case. And I'll start with the Armenian case. The Armenian genocide was not the first genocide of 20th century, as some claim. It was the second genocide preceding the genocide of the Herero. However, in its coordination, systematic implementation, and magnitude, it is considered as the first quote unquote first quote unquote modern genocide of 20th century in april 1915 the ottoman government embar embarked upon the systematic destruction of the civilian population of the eastern provinces mm -hmm. the process continued with varying intensity until the establishment of the republic of turkey by then armenians have lost about 80 percent of their population as part of a genocidal campaign in order to understand the genocide one needs to examine the phase prior to the genocide in the end of the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was faced with great challenges, economic, political, social, and religious. Its attempts for, self de for defensive modernization did not yield to the, to, to the anticipated results. More so, it became counterproductive by pushing the empire towards an economic and political decline. By becoming a debtor state, the Ottoman Empire became a semi-colonial entity like its Egyptian and Iranian counterparts. Amid this political and economic turmoil, the Christian non-dominant ethnic groups infused with the new ideology of nationalism began the struggle for their independence. Backed by European power powers, most of them were unable to achieve their independence. Armenians remained one of the last groups demanding the improvement of their condition in the boundaries of the, uh, of the empire. By 1914, the Ottoman Empire has virtually lost most of its European and North African territories. This decline led to the intensification of ethnic tensions within the empire, especially between the Turks and the Armenians. The demands of the Armenian ecclesiastic and political leadership for administrative reforms in the Armenian provinces, their demand to halt the frequent attacks by the Kurdish tribes on Armenians, their demand, demand to decrease the heavy taxation, their, the, the friction and addition to this, the friction with the newly immigrated Muslims from the Caucasus and the Balkans, their demand to stop the corruption in the administration did not yield to any results. The Ottoman government seemed to, be, to have been ambivalent to find any substantial remedy to the de deteriorating condition of the eastern provinces. Many scholars tend to use the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 13 as an important juncture that led to a dra dramatic change in the attitudes of the CUP towards the Armenians. Contrary to this approach, I would argue that the real source of contention between the two groups prior to the genocide was the Armenian reform project which threatened the integrity of the Ottoman Empire. Armenian re leadership, aided by the European powers, passed the Ottoman government, pressed the Ottoman government to improve the condition of the Armenian e and Armenians in the eastern vilayets, in the eastern provinces. The European interest in reforming the eastern provinces should also be seen as part of the competition between the European powers. On the one side, you have Italy, Britain, and France. On the other side, you have Russia. And uh, the third side would be Germany. The project suggested the creation of single province consisting of the six uh, eastern provinces, Erzurum, Van, Bitlis, Diyarbakir, Harput, and Sivas. 
either under the, an Ottoman Christian or a European governor general to be appointed by the great powers. Germany opposed the project and succeeded in uh, obtaining significant modifications. Basically, they're trying to divide the Ottoman Empire into two zones. And this, this is the last th area that has been remained for the Ottoman Empire. And to that extent, it's, 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 a, it's an extremely important factor uh, threatening the uh, integrity, disinte disintegrity of the Ottoman Empire. When World War I broke out in August 1914, the Ottoman Empire formed part of the Triple Alliance with other central powers, Germany and Austria-Hungary, -Hung and it declared war on Russia and its Western allies, Great, Great Britain and France. The Ottoman government had always thought of finding a solution to the Armenian question, despite the fact that the idea of finding a solution fluctuated. What was the solution? World War I provided the ultimate opportunity for the CUP to solve the Armenian question through a systematic plan of extermination under the, gu under the guise of deportation. These deportees consisting of women and children, elderly, sick men, became victims to the attacks of the special organization, otherwise known as Teshkilati Mahsusa, the Kurdish tribe, Turkish Chataz bands, Ottoman gendarmes, and refugees, Muhajirs. The genocide process, unlike that of the Rwandan, was, Rwandan one, was a long process that took years to finalize. The end result was that the, most of the Armenians were uprooted from, their, from the Ottoman Empire, from the area that they consider, considered and considered as their historic homeland. Now coming to the Rwandan case. The Rwandan genocide is considered to be the most rapid extermination campaign of the 20th century in which more than half a million Tutsi were killed by the Hutu in just 100 days, in what scholar, African scholar Gerard Prunier would call the hur hurricane of death. Prior to genocide, Rwanda's population was composed of three ethnic groups totaling 7 million. Hutu, about 85, Tutsi, 14%, and Tuwa, 1%. During the, during the course of the second half of the 20th century, tensions existed between the Hutu majority and the Tutsi minority. These tensions exploded in the beginning of the 1990s when the RPF, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, a, a rebel group led by Paul Kagame, who is currently the president, and most Tutsi refugees from Uganda invaded northern Rwanda in an attempt to defeat the Rwandan government dominated by the Hutu. Thus began the Rwandan civil war, exacerbating the ethnic tensions in the country. In reaction to this, many Hutu and many Hutus yielded to the side of the Hutu extremists represented by the old ideology of Hutu power. The situation dramatically deteriorated on April 6 at 8.30 p.m. in 1994 when the plane carrying President Juvenal Habyarimana was shot down near Kigali, the capital of Rwanda. Immediately, violence began to spread under the cover of war. Hutu extremists who now formed provisional government led by Col Colonel Theonosto Bagorosa launched their premeditated plan to exterminate the entire Tutsi population. The extermination did not include only two Tutsi, but also moderate Hutus, who were called as Ibizo in, uh, in uh, Kenya Rwanda language. So thus, in a period of 100 days, beginning on April 6, an estimated 800,000 men, women, and children were systematically exterminated, perhaps as, as three quarters of the Tutsi population. What is unique in the Rwandan genocide is that most of the particip participants were ordinary men, using Christopher Browning's term. An estimated 200,000 Hutu participated in the killing of their Tutsi neighbors. Despite its complexity, we can now clearly say that the genocide was a conscious choice by the Hutu extremist elite who was successful in pitting the Hutu majority against the Tutsi minority. The genocide ended when the RPF was able to defeat the Hutu perpetrators in July and uh, capturing uh, 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 Kigali and Paul Kagame assumed control of the, over the country. Now he's the president. And the last case I'm talking about before entering uh, into thematic uh, analysis is the case of Darfur. I should have shown you some maps, but never mind, nevertheless. Darfur is, the, is in the western part of Sudan Republic, which comprises three states. As you can see, northern Darfur, western Darfur, and southern Darfur, sharing borders with Libya, Chad, and the Central African Republic. The vast majority of the population are both the so-called quote-unquote black Africans and quote-unquote Arabs. Both of them are Muslims. The mass killing of the black Africans of Darfur by the government of Sudan in cooperation with the Janjaweed, 
paramilitary group that I'm going to discuss more in detail later, beginning in 2003, constitutes, constitutes the first genocide of the 21st century. Through the years, the amount of killing has been fluctuated. It is estimated that between 300,000 to 400,000 Darfurians have been killed as a result of the genocide and or genocide by attrition. Genocide by attrition means that they have been denied food. They were allowed to starve, starvation, to die from starvation, dehydration, and unattended injuries. The crisis in Darfur has grown out of a result of several factors, first of which is the civil war between the Islamist, Khartoum-based national government, and two other rebel groups from Darfur. This is the SLA, the Sudanese, Sudan Liberation Army, and the second one is the Justice and Equality Movement, JEM. The reason of the re revolt was the peripheralization of Darfur and its economic and political marginalization, which kept the region in dire situation. Another major source of contention between these groups was the competition over <coughs> natural resources. Economically, the Arab groups had been nomadic herders, while the African groups, uh, mainly such groups as Fur, Masalit, and Zagawa, were pastoralists. The response of the government to the revolt was to arm the irregular militia called as the Janjaweed, uh, ho horse devils on the, on the back of horses. That's, that's what Janjaweed means, to eradicate the rebellion. But, e but eventually, they started targeting the innocent civilians, thousands of, uh, thousands, thousands of whom became the victims of the Janjaweed terror. Sudanese forces and Janjaweed militia attacked hundreds of vill villages throughout Darfur, and over 400 villagers, villages were completely destroyed, and millions of civilians were forced to flee their homes. By the year 2000, the mass killings in Darfur were recognized as genocide by the United States under the Articles of the United Nations Con Genocide Convention. Both the UN and the African Union sought to stop the violence in Sudan by introducing forces and supplying humanitarian aid to the thousands of Darfurian refugees who are either in refugee camps or have fled to the neighboring Chad. In March 2009, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for the Sudanese President Omar, Omar al-Bashir for directing a campaign of mass killing, rape, and pillage against civilians in Darfur. Despite this progress, according to, to UN estimates, 2.7 million Darfur Darfurians today remain in inherently in internally displaced people's camp, persons camp, DIP. The Sudan has the largest DIP in, 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 world, in the world. And more than 4.7 million Darfuris rely on humanitarian aid. Now, I just gave you a brief overview of the three genocides just as a historical background. Now I'm going to analyze according to, according to theme, and the first theme is ideology. Ideology is if it's racism or nationalism. I deem, to, I deem it necessary to emphasize the fact that genocide is never an outcome of a single factor. Rather, it is a complex phenomenon that results from a web of different inter interrelated factors. The most powerful actor in any genocide is not bureaucracy, nor industry, nor weaponry. Rather, it is the ideology. In the case of Darfur, ideology of racism plays an important role in the genocide. Once a colonized country, Sudanese government now took the role of colonizing the people of Darfur. The same mechanism that the European used in colonizing the Africans has been applied by the government of Sud Sudan on Darfur. At the beginning of this racial, at the beginning, this racial and ethnic differences were not present in Darfur. The idea of quote-unquote Arab versus quote-unquote African distinction took on its present meaning through ideological construction, which occurred much later, starting around the middle period of the 20th century. Like all the post-colonial states in Africa, Sudan also became the victim of an imperial cartography. Sudan was created by the Turco-Egyptians in 1881 and petrified by the British in 1898 was, and was made out of Muslim, quote-unquote Arab, and black, quote-unquote Africans. The Africans in the South detached themselves from their traditional African religi religions by becoming Muslims and co or converting to Christianity. And it was only by the, uh, by the 70s that an Arab Islamic supremacist ideology sponsored by no one himself than Muammar Gaddafi of Libya gained a strong foothold in Darfur in the 70s. This ideology became an instrument of domination that demeaned black Africans. Despite the fact that most of the population of Darfur are Muslims, the state-led ideology distinguished between Arabs and black Africans and took the side of Arabs in disputes o uh, over land in Darfur. President Omar al-Bashir, aggressively continued the ideology of Arabism by further marginalizing Darfur and leading to the process of genocide. In the case of Rwanda, uh, 
the ideology of racism is very much dominant in compa comparison to the Armenian or the Darfurian case. After the genocide of Rwanda, commentators all around the world viewed the acts of extreme case of common, the acts of an acts of the violence as an extreme case of common African problem, and that's it. The ancient tribal hatred. When these are Africans, they are they are formed as tribes. They're fighting each other. As we all know, this approach has been extremely problematic and misleading to, in understanding the real causes of the genocide. The real answer actually lies in the ways in which the colonial administration manipulated race and ethnicity in Rwanda. Until the beginning of the 20th century, the Hutu, Hutus and the Tutsis did not constitute separate nations in terms of distinct, distinct ethnicities, ethnicities because they shared the same language, Kenya Rwanda shared the same language, territory, and religion. In the pre-colonial period, they, viewed, they were viewed as social caste. To put it in simple words, Tutsis owned cattle, whereas Hutus tilled the land. The lines between the two groups were fluid and permeable. Thus, prior to the Europeans, there was no racial violence between the two groups, mainly to the, due to the fact that the cat category of race did not exist. After the scramble of Africa, Germany established indirect suzerainty over Rwanda in 1894 using the existing centralized structure of Mwamship, the kingship. And after its defeat in World War I, Belgians took over Rwanda in 1916. They were the first to rigidly codify Hutu and, Hutu and Tutsi designations. And in 1930s, they introduced identity card cards that labeled Rwandans according to their ethnicity, a system that was perpetuated by the post-genocide government, post-colonial government, excuse me, not genocide, post-colonial government. By using the classic formula of divide and conquer, the Belgians backed the Tutsi minority by considering them as their colonial favorites and protégés. By doing so, they reinforced the Tutsi dominance increased by doing so, they reinforced the Tutsi dominance and increased the arbitrariness of local rule. Thus, under colonial rule, race did not only become a source of power for the Tutsi minority, rather it also became a symbol of oppression for the Hutu majority. The colonial administration with, it, with their quote-unquote scientific anthropologists legitimized the present by projecting it on the past leading to political and cultural hegemony. This led to the art artificial creation of the Tutsi as a superior race and Hutu as the inferior race. The justification of this was by the employment of the Hamitic hypothesis, hypothesis, which depicted the Hutu as offspring of Ham, the black son of Noah, cursed by God and destined forever to serve as, and I quote, hewers of wood and drawers of water, which is Joshua 2, 9.23. And by noble contrast, the Tutsi caste descended from the Nilotic civilization of classical Egypt. As was typical of imperial racial theorizing, the mark of civilization was grafted on physiognomic difference with, general, with the generally taller, supposedly more refined Tutsis destined to rule, and shorter, allegedly less refined Hutus to serve. After World War II and with the rise of anti-colonial movement in Africa, the Tutsis educated elite pioneered many anti-colonial initiatives resulting in a dramatic shift of the Belgian colonial policy towards supporting the Hutu majority now. Eventually, this resulted in the Hutu revolution of 1959 that led to the massacres of thousands of Tutsis and thousands of others escaped uh, to Zaire, Tanzania, and especially to Uganda. It was in Uganda that the Tutsis were going to form the Rwandan Patriotic uh, Front, RPF, led by General Paul Kagame in 1987. Prior to the genocide, Rwanda was ruled by President Habraimana, Habra Habra who seized power after the coup of 1973, under whom uh, specifically the condition of the Tutsis was slightly improved. During his reign, what came to be known as the Akazu, which was the little house, this inter internal elite that was ruling uh, uh, Rwanda, became more radical. Racist propaganda against the Tutsi became the norm in Ruman Rwanda. In 1991, the term Hutu power, which conveyed the absolute supremacy of the Hutu over the Tutsi in all matters of li life, be it political, social, economic, and religious, was coined. As discussed earlier, things would change dramatically by the assassination of, president, of the president in April 6, 1994. And finally, the section on uh, ideology pertaining to Armenian genocide. 
The Western ideology of nationalism played an important role in the Armenian genocide. As an ideology, nationalism was a late comer to the Ottoman Turkish elite. It was mainly characterized in reaction to the ethno-nationalist movement in the Balkans and territorial losses of the Ottoman Empire. The main protagonist of Turkish nationalism was the Committee of Union and Progress, an opposition group that was formed in the Royal Military Medical Academy in 1889. After witnessing arrest, arrest by the despotic Hamidi regime, the group moved to Europe, primarily to, primarily to France and Egypt. They were secularists who in their rigid modernity favored un adulterated Westernism. Their occult and religious tendencies had its roots in positivism, biological materialism, and social da da Darwinism. This scientific, scientific evolutionary outlook mixed with the rising Turkish nation nationalism in the first decade of the 20th century was going to have a major impact on the final solution to the Armenian question, which had been obstinately raised diplomatically ever since the Congress of Berlin. Historians until recently have argued that the ideology of the CUP has been represented by three sometimes overlapping identity poles, Ottomanism, Islamism, and Turkism. However, I would argue that the young Turks viewed Islam instrumentally and Ottomanism with reservation, and their Turkism had sharper edges. In the second constitutional period, the CUP was going eventually to abandon the two identity poles in favor for the third, Turkism. The independence movement in empire, the rising nationalism in the Balkans, the continuous territorial diminution coupled with the European pressures on the Ottoman Empire nationally, nation, naturally would result in the radicalization of Turkish nationalism. This new Turkish nationalism envisioned, envisioned a homo homogenous society that was to be realized through social engineering. This process consisted of an array of policies ranging from marginalization, economic boycott, isolation, deportation, forced assimilation, massacres that culminated eventually in the Armenian genocide. The process was completed by adding to these policies the nationalization of the Turkish economy through confiscation and appropriation of the Armenian economy as part of larger project of creating Turkish bourgeoisie. The second, now the second theme, propaganda, mobilization, and orders of extermination. We, we keep asking the questions, who were the perpetrators of these genocides? Why did they take part in the genocide? How were they mobilized? How did the state send the orders to the perpetrators? And what is the relation of the, the implementation of these genocide and their actors have to do with the, with the concept of modernity? In the course of World War I, during which the Ottoman Empire was fighting on three fronts, one would think that the Armenian genocide happened in a chaotic situation, or as Turkish denialist historians would claim, things went out of hand, sinking the empire into the abyss of decentralization. A closer look at the administration would demonstrate the sophisticated level of organization at the time which the inner circle of the CUP had hijacked the government and had full control over the situation. For example, in glancing through the official Gazette Takvimi Vekai from November 18, 1914 to November 13, 1915, we noticed that hundreds of temp temporary laws were passed, a good number of which concentrated on strengthening the telegraphic system in the empire. Thus, the mastermind of the genocide, the, interior, the Minister of Interior, Talat Pasha, had access to the remote provinces of the empire, some, some people say even from his home. Historians argue that the, that the tu that dual track me mechanism e e existed during the Armenian genocide. I would argue that it was actually a tripartite track mechanism rather than dual. The tripartite mechanism appears to have functioned in the following ways. The interior ministry sent telegrams to the provinces, pro provincial governors, which were of two type. One was regular orders, and the other was the other one was orders in which there were euf there was euphemism. So basically, you even get uh, documents sent from the center. They're regular documents. You can't claim that every document that was sent from the center had euphemism in it, you know. But and and the third type would be oral orders for killing. So the third track, the CUP Central Committee sent oral killing orders to the provinces primarily through the CUP secretaries or couriers. This in itself contradicts the idea of the role of mod modern technology in the process of extermination. The perpetrators of the Armenian genocide were represented by a variegated, uh, consisting of, from variegated group consisting of the special organization, Ottoman gendarmes, Kurdish tribesmen, Chetas, uh, Muhajirs, and of, of course ordinary men. The most important actor in this variegated group was the special organization. 
As to the propaganda, we do not see any type of propaganda during the World War I except one uh, booklet that was called the Armenian Aspiration and Revolutionary Movements. It, it was translated into four languages, and that was the only thing I've seen. I don't see the same propaganda that you see the, during the genocide, in, for example, in Rwanda. The book is a fabricated source of propaganda that aims at depicting Armenians and Ottoman uh, provinces through photographic, uh, through photographic manipulation and claiming that they were all the Armenians were uprising. Of course, there were some uprisings, but it doesn't. Uh, it, but generalization doesn't justify whatever happened. In the case of Darfur, the government also relied on paramilitary organization called the Janjaweed Devils on the Horseback. The Janjaweed, backed by the government of Sudan, plays played plays an important role in the genocide. According to Prunier, the Janjaweed have six main origins, former bandits and highwaymen, demobilized soldiers from the army, young members of Arab tribes having land conflict with the African tribes, former criminals released from the prison if they joined the militia, fanatical members of the Darfuran Union of Arabs, actually this was funded by Muammar Gaddafi, and finally young and un unemployed quote-unquote Arab men. Usually the attacks would proceed in the following manner. The government would conduct aerial attacks on the villages, which would be immediately followed by brutal attacks by the Janjaweed, sometimes in the company of regular army units, and would ravage the village from killing cattle, burning houses, to mass raping of women. With the aid of the, with the, aid of the uh, government troops, the Janjaweed were bent on either f uh, forcing the black Africans to flee Sudan or killing them. Consequently, hundreds of villages had been utterly destroyed by the government troops and the Janjaweed, leading to killing of thousands of people, mass rape, and displacement of hundreds of thousands of people, majority of which fo are found haven in the internally displaced, displaced camps in Sudan or fled, or fled to the camps in neighboring Chad. In addition to the ideological factors, the, in the process of mobilize, mobilization, there was a strong economic dimension to the genocide like in its Armenian counterpart. The immediate benefit of the Janjaweed was opportunity that they have gained in looting the non-Arab villages, and the longer-term benefit was dispossessing the Africans from their lands. In addition to this, the Janjaweed were paid what amounted to a good salary given to the dire economic situation in the region. $79 a month for a man on foot, $117 for a man on horse or a camel. Officers in Janjaweed would get as much as $233. Beginning late in 19, uh, 2006 and continuing on to 2007, the government troops and the Janjaweed began carrying out attacks even on the IDP, internally displaced people's camps, and even on the refugee camps in Chad, where the two groups continued to kill people and rape girls and women at, uh, at will. Thus, the Janjaweed played an important role in the government's counter-insurgency in, uh, counter counter strategy, which was, during the which was draining the swamp to get rid of the fish. The case of Rwanda represents the most coherent case of propaganda, mobilization, and orders of extermination. I would argue that the medium of media, i.e. propaganda, accelerated the process of mobilization. In this case, Two, mobilization is not, is not a phenomenon pertaining to modernity. Mobilization is not a phenomenon pertaining to modernity. Since the 17th century, the political organization of Rwandan society was characterized by centralization, which became a major factor in facilitating and accelerating the genocide of 1994. The Belgian colonial reforms created a uh, quote-unquote modern Rwanda highlight, highlighted by centralized political system, efficient, neo-traditionalist, neo and Catholic. Many were almost constantly under mobilization by the state to work for the state in the fields in construction and ag agriculture, some, something that is, running, uh, that is a running theme in the economies of coercion, of colonialism, and the best example of this is the, is the rubber production in Congo. The Hutu regime continued this method from 1917 onward by calling it Umuganda, which basically me meant free labor demanded from the peasant, and Umuganda became one of the most important component of the Hutu regime's ideology. As a matter of fact, during the Rwandan genocide, people would be called for a special Umuganda, an agricultural term that became the euphemism of clearing the bush. Those who took part in the genocide were divided into four groups, ordinary men, majority of which ordinary men, military personnel, especially the presidential guard, the inter and the Impuza Mungabi militiamen. I would like to elaborate more on the last two militiamen. 
The Interahamwe, which means those who work together in Kenya, Rwanda, was an extremist Hutu paramilitary unit that was fundamentally, that was fundamental to the Rwandan genocide of 1994, was the most important of the anti-Tutsi militias prevailing throughout the country. It was originally trained by the, by the French at the request of the government of Rwanda, uh, or government of Rwandan president, Juvenal Hab Habyarimana. Immediately after the assassination of the president, the militia began the tsunami of violence. Their activities were closely monitored by the MRND, which is the Mouvement Révolutionnaire National pour le Développement, the National Revolutionary Movement for Development. Their participation in genocide is a testimony for the premeditation of the genocide. The other group called Impuzamungambi, which means those with single purpose, those with single purpose, which was a Hutu, which was a Hutu militia movement comprising of by youth and run by the Hutu extremist party, the CDR, which otherwise known as the Coalition, Coalition, Coalition pour, la Defense, de, pour la Defense de la République. The youth were recruited, trained, armed, and led by the Rwandese government forces. They were very active during the genocide. Essentially, the impose, impose, Impuza Mangabi constituted an armed wing of the CDR, the latter of which was uh, dominated by uh, fanatically anti-Tutsi agenda. And the main person who was giving orders was Colonel Theonesta Bagosora. He was giving the orders for genocide. Among the three cases, the use of propaganda was very dominant and effective in the case of the Rwandan genocide, using both the medium of press and radio. The newspaper Kang Kangwara, which means wake them up, published by the Hutu supremacist Hassan Ngeze, propagated exclusively anti-Tutsi pro propaganda. Actually, Hassan Ngeze was one of the first people to be tried after the uh, military tribunal of Rwanda took place. In December 1990, Ngeze published the most infamous and racist document under the title of the Hutu Ten Commandments, one of which, one of which, one of which articles actually stated the following, Hutus must stop having mercy over Tutsis. More influential than the Kangura was the Rwandan radio, which during the genocide played a dramatic role in inciting the Hutu masses against the Tutsis and directing the killers to the specific locations of the victims. Nicknamed as the Hutu Power Radio, the RTLM, Radio Television Libre de la Mille Colline, Thousand Hills Free Radio and Television, was the most important pro propaganda arm which began broadcasting from July 8, 1993 until it was shut down by the advance of the Rwandan Patriotic Front, front Troops to Onkigali, Onkigali on, on, January, on July 3, 1994. RTLM broad broadcasted venomous propaganda inciting the masses and calling them, calling the uh, the Tutsi as Inyenzi. Inyenzi means cockroaches and this, 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 Dehumanize, dehumanization is very much uh, dominant in the case of Rwanda also, in Yenzi, cockroaches, and they, that, that they should be killed by all good citizens. And finally, the tools of implementation. As we notice, most of the tools used in the three genocide were pre-modern tools, alluding to the primitive and pre-industrial nature of the genocide. The reason of this is mainly due to the economic, and condition, the economic condition of the three countries. In the Armenian genocide, the perpetrators, perpetrators used, used daggers, blunt instruments, in order to save shell or powder, burning, some cases drowning. More so, the means of deportation was the cheapest and the most primitive forms of killing. Thousands of women, children, and elderly people died on the death marches. Walking barefooted under the scorching sun and freezing night temperatures, a good percentage of them died or were killed by the perpetrators mentioned earlier in this talk. The other primitive method of killi killing was through concentration camps along the Syrian Mesopotamian route controlled by the Aleppo sub-directorate. Genocide by attrition was also a common factor in the Armenian genocide. In the case of deportation and concentration camps, the perpetrators deliberately denied adequ adequate water, foodstuff, and medical attention for those who were injured or inflicted with the raging variety of epidemics. In the case of Darfur, the tools of genocide was, was primitive, semi-modern. The pattern in the Darfur, Darfurian case was in the following way. Russian-built four-engine Antonov AN-126 would fly over the village dumping makeshift bombs, bombs that were made out of oil, oil drums stuffed with mixture of explosives and metallic debris for the sole purpose of terrorizing the population. These were followed by more MiGs or combat helicopters firing rockets or on or, or rockets on schools or warehouses. When the air attacks were finished, 
the Janjaweed would arrive in order to finish the job. These are the militia. They employed two patterns of raids, the Janjaweed. One of them was called hard pattern and the soft pa pattern. Hard pa pattern usually ended up with killing and soft pattern rapes. Uh, marginalization and uh, uh, deportation and uh, kicking them outside of, of Sudan. And in the case of Sudan, genocide by attrition was also very common uh, uh, in the Darfurian case. I'm not going to dwell too much on the Rwandan genocide because Rwandan genocide is often referred to as the Mashiti genocide. Mashiti is also called Panga in Swahili, became the main symbol of the genocide that took the lives of 800,000 people. The Mashiti is, in, in, is an agricultural tool owned by most Rwandan household, which was used during the genocide to cultivate the souls of human beings. As a matter of fact, the biggest supplier of Mashitis in Africa is a British company called Chillington's Company. And uh, some historians say that the, prior to the genocide, the order of Mashitis was, uh, was uh, doubled in, uh, by the government in, in, in Rwanda. You can go online and see the company. They sell all types of uh, agriculture tools. In concluding, the following lecture, I attempted, tried, tried to dialogue, initiate a dialogue with the relation between modernity and non-European genocide. The, the, the three genocides under study took place in the modern period, but were not affected directly by modernity. The ambiguous concept of modernity was only one factor in these genocides among the other numerous factors. In all these societies, genocide took place during the process of modernization. Thus, they are the byproduct of the process uh, taking place in semi slash post colonial era. In the case of Rwanda, the Belgian colonialism introduced a disfigured form of modernization represented in the forceful imposition of a time bomb ideology. Sudan, imitating its creator, its creator is Britain, adopted internal colonialism adopted internal colonialism in its policy towards Darfur that resulted in the genocide, something that's still going on. In the case of the Ottoman Empire, the politico-economic semi-colonialism of the empire coupled with the imported idea of nationalism played an important role in the genocide. Thus, modernity in all these three, three cases was in reality a European project to dominate them. It was in the context of the direct and or indirect domination that mass violence was born, not in the forms of uh, Baumannian bureaucratic or industrial modernity, but in an ideology imported from and imposed by Europe. Thank you very much.